Okay, hi everyone. We're gonna get going. It's just after noon. So thank you for being here. My name is Jenny Vanoss. I am an associate professor in SOS and one of the organizers of the SOS seminars. We're really appreciative of everyone coming today um, to um, listen to wisdom from Ed Chu. So I'm honored to welcome Ed here today to give the SOS seminar. He really needs no introduction. He told me that. <laughs> he doesn't want a long intro. He doesn't want a long introduction, so I'm not allowed to do a long introduction. But for those of you who do not know um, Ed, he is a special advisor to the president on environment and climate solutions, and he's spending time this year here at ASU uh, as a Global Futures Scholar um, uh, within our GFL. So he's um, the Deputy Regional Administrator for the EPA Region 7. Um, and brings 30 years of environment and energy policy experience, um, passion for public service and sustainability, and commitment to effective management. So I think we're going to learn a lot from Ed today. Um, there will be time after the talk for questions, and then there's also time set aside afterwards from 1 to 1.30 or so for some um, food just outside the door here. So um, you might be able to talk to Ed after that as well. So without further ado, I will leave it to you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I usually don't want a lot of uh, words and introductions because that creates uh, expectations. Uh, so uh, what, what I want to do today is, uh, first of all, I'd like all of you to really be engaged with me uh, because I hear the room is really cold. And the way to get it heated up is body heat. Come on, folks, right? And so uh, get some calories burning. Um, just to get, get this started, I. Uh, you know, I am old. I, I say this often to a lot of people. So the first thing I did was I called my daughter, uh, who is at University of Washington. She's a sophomore. And I said to her, hey, look, I'm giving a lecture. And they didn't tell me what to say or what to do. So I'm coming up with, I'm making some stuff up. But what should I do? You know, I think they're going to get people to the room. But how do I keep their, how do I? And she said, just bring food. And I think Jenny already did that, but I'm actually, I actually have extra food. And what I'll be doing, Dave White suggested this, uh, that I'm going to be throwing at you for, as a reward, Pavlov dogs. And, and so you'll see my skills in throwing also. Uh, and let me see your skills in uh, 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 catching. The other thing that I ask you for participation is I know you guys have, do you guys know about the snapping? Okay. So since uh, to keep your attention, if you hear me say anything that you agree or you, you think ought to be uh, recognized, uh, just give me some snaps, all right? Come on, let's everybody practice. Okay, so uh, let me start by uh, um, talking about this slide first um, because I, I have to tell you a little bit of an anecdote before I get started. And, and Chris Boone is uh, sitting here as well. And, He's, ever since I've arrived, Chris has been asking about, okay, how do I, uh, what do we talk about in terms of getting green jobs, jobs after college, right? And how do we um, uh, engage our students about the work that you hope to do, right, in your career and taking a career journey? And I, you know, I, I don't really think about that a lot. At, uh, at work, right? And most of us don't in the jobs that we do. But last October, um, I spent uh, time with a hero of mine. Uh, we had a management retreat at EPA, and uh, this was a leadership retreat. And one of the, I, and I was one of the speakers at that. And but one of my partner speaker was a gentleman named Robert Cabana. You can Google him. By the way, I know this is a world of Googling and uh, searching, so AI searches. You can do any, anybody that I mention, you should Google right away. Uh, Bob Cabana uh, was at the time, I think he's retired now in December, the highest ranking senior officer at NASA. And he was one of the 3,000 or so people who've actually seen Earth, that picture from space. So we have this conversation about leadership and all of that. Uh, so at the end of the presentation, he's, he turns to me and to other people in the room who, who can uh, hear and says to me, um, uh, he's very gracious. You don't think that this is a man who's seen, who's been in space and he never likes to talk about that and so on. But uh, he turns to me and the people who could hear this and say, Ed, 
I am really glad and thankful of all the work that you are doing and your colleagues are doing. Because when he's, and most astronauts, he says, says this, when they see Earth from space, now you can't see this, but look at how thin the atmosphere is. He says, that's what protects us from this cold space that I was in. And he says, you are the people who are protecting that planet, that thin atmosphere. Powerful to me as an old guy and lots of people in that room. And I want all of you to kind of feel that, uh, people who are involved in sustainability. And because your job is not recycling, your job is to protect the planet, right? That's what he said. Come on, give me some snaps on this. Thank you. All right, so that's my story. I, I wanted to share that because it inspired me this year. It's, you know, I'm always looking for some inspiration because it does get kind of stale, right? All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, this is what usually people call disclaimers. But I'm going to say these are my claimers. So these are my lessons that I've learned over the years. And I think that's what Josh and Jenny wanted to, me to talk about in the context of environmental policymaking and about careers in environmental policymaking. So they're also based on my long term, long time um, experience as a practitioner. I am not an academic uh, and the work that I do day to day, um, I'm in a situation where I have to make decisions every day that affect people's lives. And usually there's not enough information to make that decision, but you have to do it. And those of you who made decisions and you know, even in your personal decisions you make, that's what you do every day. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but, but it is a very, very, um, uh, I would say, a lot of folks who work in my position and my field, there's a huge level of burden that's involved. So I'll talk more about that as well. And I have been in public service. You can call me a bureaucrat if you don't like public servants, but please call me a public servant, all right? And I, I make that distinction because there are public servants who are uh, elected officials, there are public servants who are advocates, but I would say I'm a public servant who is a government official. I, and I'll talk about that And because there are jobs that uh, require you to do different set of things. If you're an advo in advocacy or if you're an academic, even if your passion is protecting the planet, the type of work that you do and the skills that you need are very different. So I, want, I will talk about that uh, in the storytelling that I'll be doing today. The other thing that I will claim is that um, biodiversity and ecosystems are extremely important, but most of my career I spent thinking about public health because that's what EPA does. Um, and we have a lot of people working on health issues. So that's what I do. Air quality, water quality, drinking water. Are you able to swim at the beaches? That's the kind of work that I've been involved in. And it's also from a federal perspective. This is an important one because I am going to talk about policy making at the federal, state, and local levels and why that's important for everyone to understand what the distinctions are, opportunities, and challenges associated with doing public service in uh, those areas. So environmental protection in the US. So I'm not looking at my notes, which I really should, which means that you can correct me if I say the dates and things wrong, all right? So, so before I get into this, I'm going to do my candy thing. I'm going to throw it at somebody. Rachel Carson. And Jenny, of course. So um, um, who's read it? OK, I'm disappointed. You should all have read that book. Here's why. I'm not going to talk about the reasons that people like that book in a traditional way. I'm coming strictly from an uh, uh, environmental policy perspective. That book is a science book, all right? It is a, a book that's written by a marine biologist talking about pesticide exposure in the United States. Extremely well documented, footnoted, citations everywhere. and and. Uh, it, it, just think about all of that. So the, the, the methodology that she goes through in the book is something that you all in your career should be 
understanding and exposed to. So one other aspect that I, I will talk about this, the reason that I want you to read that book is the other is not just the science and the, the STEM background that's required to write a book like that. That's what EPA does. We need biologists. We need hydrogeologists. We need epidemiologists, right? We need toxicologists. STEM is the foundation for the environmental protection that we do in the United States, right? So that's one thing, one point I wanted to make. The second thing is, when that book came out, that particular pesticide that she talks about, DDT, do you guys know, anybody know what that is? Uh, not, not you guys, in the front row. I mean, these are the people who know everything. They want to sit in the front row. I mean, like, come on. You, you know how that works in classrooms, right? I don't want to talk to them. I want to talk to all of you back there. Josh? Anyway, so, so uh, Josh is always sitting back there. So I don't know what's going on with the you know, dean of your school. But anyway, so the other thing that I want to point out is um, um, when that came out, she was fundamentally shaking the foundation of the pesticide industry in the United States. DuPont, Monsanto went after her, all right? The reason that science is important, I'm gonna, this is why I'm sharing, is that uh, uh, the reason that it's so important, all of you to understand this, is that um, that book, we all remember still, because it was able to withstand that scrutiny. It's not something that just people said, hey, I believe this. There was science behind it, and she was able to demonstrate it. In fact, President Kennedy had his science advisory council to review it. Guess what happened? Medal of Freedom for her, Jimmy Carter. Big deal, right? So, so this is, I just want all of you to understand why I'm talking about this, because I know Chris wants people to understand what kinds of things that we do and what are the things that you need to know to get into this. I mean, this is really an important thing. Um, but the other aspect that I want to talk about, and I, you know, President Crow is my temporary boss, right? So I have to talk about him. You know, there's also a rule. You should always say nice things about your boss. Uh, so, so I'm going to say something nice about him. So, when I first met with him, and I've, if people have heard this story from me, and you, many of you have actually heard this from President Crow himself, he talks about the fact that one of the challenges that you see in the environmental world is that academics and universities have been responsible for a lot of the unintended and negative consequences in the world. So, Pearl, so who knows uh, a gentleman named Paul Herman Mueller? Zero. Nobel Prize winner in 1948 for DDT. Why don't you know this? And you know about Silent Spring. It's not a full story, right? DDT saved hundreds of thousands of soldiers during the war, World War II. Controlling malaria, yellow fever, Someone received a Nobel, P Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for that in 1948. You can Google this. A Swiss scientist, right? It did good and great things for humanity. Mosquito control, that's why we used it in the United States. But her point, which a lot of people miss in the book, is that it wasn't used appropriately. It wasn't recognized. That's the science part of it, right? So EPA now, when we register pesticides, we still use pesticides. DDT is banned. And the reason that DDT is banned is it's a wide spectrum. It kills everything. That's why she, she talks about silencing birds and bees and human kids, right, in the book. The idea is that how do you regulate and what sort of uh, thinking you, do you have to do to make decisions about which pesticides are appropriate for when and how much should you use. That's what EPA does. Because agriculture in the United States, without pesticides, would not be the same. But we don't want you to use certain things at certain places when kids are around. You know, that's why certain chemicals... So it's so a pesticide program at EPA called, is called pesticide registration. 
because we are to use them. So, so the reason that I'm sharing that is that on everything that we do, every risk that we manage, it's about managing things that are good in one and the impact, the impact of it. And I, I want you guys to look at uh, Paul Herman Mueller because he did great things. He has a Nobel Prize and he should be linked to Silent Spring because of a number. And for policy people, this is really important to have that understanding. Okay. Are we good so far? I don't see any snaps, man. I just, come on. <laughs> okay. So the other thing about this, I always say I'm old and I am. And here's why I say this. EPA was created in 1970. You know, 1970 was the first Earth Day, right? How many of you are born before 1970? Yeah. I didn't expect you to actually raise your hand. For, for, that, for that, you guys can have the entire bowl. All right, so, uh, so my daughter, I'm gonna tell Kiki, my daughter, her name is Kiele, and we call her Kiki, but uh, she has a Hawaiian name, but, but the reason that, that I, she said that you all were going to be like Pavlov's dogs when I ask you questions. So uh, I'm going to tell her that was true. Okay. So in, in 1970, it was established in 1970. There's a bunch of things that happened, which I'll show you some uh, slides of here. Um, but one of the things that's also unique, I, I'll talk about the uniqueness of American environmental policymaking, right? So the first thing is we, EPA has 30 different statutes. And this is very important, right? Because um, uh, most federal agencies have one authorizing law. I don't think people have, think about this. You know, we have a law for every media, air, water, drinking water, pesticides, right? And so uh, it's an extremely complicated regulatory scheme that we build for ourselves. And here for sustainability people, uh, one other thing to note here is that all of them primarily are to fix problems and wrongdoings of the past and through enforcement and compliance deterrence right wrongdoings that we know of for the future now that's think about that for sustainability for future it's things that we know about that you don't we don't want you to do not things that we don't want and we don't know about. You guys are teaching students and you're learning about things that in the future, really thinking about the future differently here at ASU. But I need you to know what sort of the government agencies are always thinking about. It's also based on federalism because that's what our constitution talks about is that the federal government is the backstop on this. We have environmental laws that the minimum standards that one must meet and since 1970, every state has uh, passed laws, environmental laws that are as, at least as stringent as the federal laws. So when the federal laws, uh, when the states do not do that, that's when EPA steps in, right? We have 10 regional offices. I manage one of them and 27 labs. Um, and, and we are very much focused on both um, science and the law in implementing the regulations at EPA. Um, in the United States. Now, so why do this at the federal level? Any idea? Why, why not? Why don't we just let the states do this? Josh? <laughs> so that's the number one reason. It's really about interstate commerce. See, I knew he knew the answer to this. So do you still want me to throw you a candy? I, let me test my arm here. Oh, just missed that. So, so the other, the idea here is that uh, left alone, because just like countries, I mean, if you think about states as countries, they will try to accommodate industry because we, you know, we're inventing things that benefit people, right? The economy is a big deal, right? We're in a market-based system. So they will uh, have uh, environmental standards as a competitive tool. We want you to come to Arizona because you don't have to comply with certain laws. That's the race to the bottom. The other is you guys know about this externalities. Externalities, negative impacts do not know political boundaries. So uh, just the reason I'm asking, urging you to think about this is that all of the are, we're talking about just the US, but when you start talking about climate, these boundary issues and race to the bottom issues 
exist there as well. And that's where eventually I'll get to that topic a little bit here. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about is, uh, I don't know if I should mention this. So uh, uh, Anne Gorsuch, do you know where her son is now? <laughs> so Anne Gorsuch was EPA's first uh, woman administrator, nominated by um, um, and, and, and uh, selected by President Reagan in 1980. So I'm, I'm old, so I keep talking about the 80s. I, I know many of you were born even after that. So um, that's the first time in the 1980s, um, after a decade of EPA being in existence, there was a lot of pushback finally about environmental protection. Too much burden on the industry, right? And, and the notion of a big government, I, those of us who actually remember the di uh, discussion about Mr. Reagan and the federal government is that um, people wanted to get rid of EPA. What happened was that the, you can go and Google Ann Gorsuch and the other person you should Google is Rita Lavelle. Uh, lots of scandals um, in the in early 80s, but what it resulted in is something very positive for the future in my mind, for the governance, at least environmental governance in the United States. One is um, that the, our first uh, EPA administrator, Ruckelshaus, who's the only two-time EPA administrator, and he became the two-time EPA administrator because he came in to fix the mess. Mr. Reagan appointed him after Ann Gorsuch uh, resigned. And what he did at the time was really create a foundation for environmental policy based on science and law. So if you ask anybody at EPA, what is the agency about? Most people will not just talk about the environment, but we, we, everyone will say we're about the science and the law. That seems so simple. Not that simple. Also, uh, there's been tremendous movement towards getting things out of DC because things were rotten. At least that's what the perception was in DC. So a lot of the EPA work and the policy work and the implementation work moved to the regions, the 10 regions, where they thought that it would move things out of DC. Now this has, it, uh, uh, since the eighties, this had profound implications for how we work with the states, local governments, as well as um, uh, our um, uh, regulated community. But I just wanted to share that with you because those are things that you might be interested in looking at if you're interested in the history of uh, uh, environmental policy. So huge successes. I know a lot of people are jaded about the federal government and EPA and so on, but you don't remember. I remember because I'm old. I mean, things were so shitty. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was literally so shitty that it was bad. Air quality. I mean, we, there were times people could tell you that if you got stuck in Washington, D.C. on Pennsylvania Avenue in a median because you couldn't make it across, your white shirt would turn dark because the soot would be so bad in D.C., right? Um, I have a picture of Phoenix that I'll show you. So the water quality. People could not drink water out of their tap water. I mean, now you guys choose to drink bottled water, but I still drink tap water. By the way, Tempe Tap is outstanding. Uh, salty, you know, a little hard, but it was good. So uh, uh, secondhand smoke. I mean, think about this. I'll, I'll show you a video about this. There was a time where someone said, hey, uh, when you went to a restaurant, there was a time people would say, would you like the smoking or the non-smoking section? It would be right next to them. Anyway, I'll show you that too. Uh, uh, ozone layer. Do you guys know what this is about? Right? I, so this is the first time that the global community came together and said, the Montreal Protocol, that said, an EPA with its leadership saying, hey, we need to get together and fix this. Now, we haven't been able to repeat that feat on climate and other things, but the bottom line is, but, but that's a huge accomplishment. And if you look at the UN updates now, they'll tell you that it, we're recovering. It's closing up, right? Have you guys seen the picture? I love that picture of the, the, the ozone hole. I mean, the fact that we did that, right? Lead. 
people used to say that, you know, all of us in our generation would say, if we didn't have lead, we could be doing something else, right? <laughs> yes. So we, we had lots of lead exposure, lead in gasoline, lead in paint. I mean, come on. I mean, this is just not, and acid rain, there were acidification of la, uh, um, um, uh, lakes in the uh, New England and Northeast Adirondacks, beautiful lakes that, you know, ducks were dying, fish were dying. Um, how do we solve that? I mean, there were lots of new environmental policies that went in to fix that. Pesticide, I talked about that uh, a bit. And the other thing, you notice that all of these things that I've talked about, but for the legacy contamination, are problems that are global. When I mean global, I don't mean global in scale, but it's widespread, as opposed to a site-specific, community-specific impact. And the only thing that EPA has dealt with that really deals with community specific impacts are land contamination. And I just want you to keep that in mind as well, because it will come into uh, my, con my point later about the uh, climate solutions. So let me show you some pictures. This is actually, so uh, one thing that I will also point you to is um, um, Mr. Ruckel's house. What a genius he was. Oh, hold on for a second, let me just, Am I not talking loudly enough? Okay, I will do. Okay, thank you. So, um, Mr. Ruckel's house, a smart and brilliant man he was, um, he commissioned um, a National Geographic photographer and a team to take pictures in the early 70s of the environmental conditions in the United States. So if you go to the National Archives website and type in EPA, documents, you'll find the photos that I have up here. This is Phoenix, March of 1973. Can you see the buildings? This was a normal condition. This is March, right? This is a, yeah, and so this is the condition that I grew up in, many of us grew up in. So when you recognize this, you can see the, the achievement that we, all of us uh, collectively, have brought to this country in terms of the environmental improvement, right? And, and no one could deny that, and everyone should pat themselves. You guys should all snap, each other, snap yourself for this, because you're all part of this, all right? So, so this is the uh, famous picture of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland burning. This is a picture from 1952. They, we used to dump so many chemicals into the rivers, just uncontrolled before EPA and the regulation, that the rivers would, I mean, I think that this particular river in this stretch burned about eight or nine times before 1970, just so you know. That's, this is just one event in 1952, okay? So I forgot her last name, but her first name is Mary. She's from Ohio. She lived, so that's her drinking water out of her tap, okay? So, so those of you who complain about the taste of Tempe tap, you should not be complaining. This is good. That's good water, right? I, I can, I, and they, uh, my, my work buddy Dave here knows that I say this all the time. I love drinking Tempe tap. Anyway, so, so look at, I mean, this is a picture that they documented. This is, uh, so just know that the things weren't so peachy. Exxon dump site, right? And this is, you could go to NARA and actually get these pictures. These are not me making this up. Manhattan, October of 1973, I believe. That's the condition that most of us, at least my vintage people, grew up in. Right, Chris? I'm not saying that you're my vintage, by the way. <laughs> I feel bad when I talk about age. But I'm proud of my age, so that's why I talk about it all the time. Um, so, um, uh, so this is really a, an important thing for all of us to remember the successes. And in, in terms of environmental policy, how we got here and what policies drove us to this is really important, right? That's one of the things I wanted to talk about. And most of the policies uh, so far in this country have been uh, command and control. Do you guys know what that means? meaning that we, t we set a standard and you tell industry and the polluter to meet it. Simple, right? So, and I'll come back to that and some of the innovations that that hasn't worked very well just because of the, a lot of the divisiveness and it's gonna be increasingly difficult to do that. And I'll, so I'll talk more about that as well. 
Birmingham, Alabama, same thing. I think this was also in 1973. Okay, so I'm gonna push this and see if it'll work. They didn't test this, so I, I don't know whether it'll work or not. The smokers have won, but in this battle, the smoke hasn't cleared. Many passengers without the nicotine habit say their fellow flyers should skip their cigarettes, especially on short flights, like this one between Miami and Orlando. Time in the plane, about 50 minutes. The smoke permeates the whole cabin. It's bad for the smokers. It's bad for the non-smokers. It's even worse for the non-smokers because they are bothered by somebody else's bad habit. Smoke irritates me. My eyes start to water, it's hard to breathe. I just don't feel good around it. The proposals voted down today would have stopped all smoking on short flights like this one. But the CAB feels the airlines are doing a good enough job by separating non-smokers from smokers. Any more restrictions would be too much of a headache for the airlines, the government says. But nearly all of the smokers we spoke with said if they had to, they could part with their butts for a while. I appreciate everyone else's uh, right to breathe clean air and whatever. It's a habit. I can break it. It really doesn't matter. The airlines say their barriers are enough, but some flight attendants boldly admit those barriers can't do the job. I kind of feel like I'm in the bottom of a coal mine, like I'm an old coal worker with all the smoke a lot of times. I know most flight attendants do have sinus problems. Ironically, the CAB is scheduled to go out of business at the end of the year as the deregulation of the airline industry continues. And without new laws from Congress, when the CAB goes, so do the rules on smoking. In the air between Orlando and Miami, Alan Mendelson, News 4. There's just so much to talk about in that video, but 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 I I will. Sorry. So so before I go on to that, the on to this slide, the reason that I put that in there is to illustrate several points. I personally think that that is the biggest accomplishment of EPA, and we didn't regulate a single party. So here's the story. So um, we don't have authority to regulate people's homes or your personal behavior at EPA zero authority but we do have authority to investigate dangerous substances under the superfund law so uh that was 1984 so beginning in 1988 we started uh, doing an assessment of whether or not environmental tobacco smoke or secondhand smoke is dangerous to people obviously People thought it was dangerous, but we needed, just like Rachel Carson, science. Because that's what we believe in the Western world, right? Now, now I have something to say about that, too, because uh, people talk about traditional ecological knowledge. People knew a lot of stuff that would not be believed by Western policymakers, right? But in order to do that, you have to have risk assessments and talking about how this affects human beings. So in 1993, we published this report, risk assessment, designating secondhand smoke as a carcinogen, type A carcinogen, the most dangerous carcinogen. That's it. 1995, state of California, first state in the country. They also did additional studies to follow up this, banned smoking in bars. Not to protect bar patrons, but to protect their authority was to protect waiters, bartenders, because it's an occupational hazard. So I remember I was just in Japan. I have been to Paris many times. I remember there was such a thing in Paris that everybody smokes at a cafe outside. You see zero now. In Tokyo, no smoking. We've changed the world with information. Come on, come on. That You guys need to get, this, this is a big deal. Because smoking was so pervasive that people, kids were being exposed to it in the car. So how many of you were in your car when your parents or someone else smoked? There you go. It was so pervasive 
So policy mechanisms, I mean, I'm going to get into some of the regulatory innovations and I just go through it very quickly. There's so many things that in terms of environmental policy, and I don't kind of, I, I don't uh, define policy as, in a certain way, but I, I'm going to describe it in terms of how we do business now, right? That before EPA and before American kind of policy making, and I say that's because I still believe that the way that we do business in the United States is leading the world. Some of you may disagree on some aspects of, you know, especially when we talk about climate, people are so discouraged about this. But the fact is there's a lot of things that the reason that we're disappointed is that we're not meeting up to the standards that we've set for ourselves in terms of how we want to control um, and uh, fix the problems of the past. So this is uh, that the reason that I show you this thing about the accomplishments is that there's been so much done, but there's more to do, right? And the more to do, I'll talk about this, is gonna be increasingly difficult. And that's why those of you who are students and researchers who are doing kind of a frontier work is gonna be, the work is gonna be even more important. And uh, being grounded in uh, STEM and law is going to be very important as well. So what we've learned over the, uh, uh, and the kinds of things, I, before I get into, again, these kinds of things, the obvious ones are, you guys know all about that. I mean, just even in this building, how we do ventilation and uh, filtration of air and, and things, you, you don't think EPA has been involved, but EPA has been involved in building air quality. Indoor air, we don't have authority to regulate indoor air, but we work with uh, industry groups to make sure that the air you breathe in here is just as good as the air or better, hopefully, than because we tell people when the air quality is bad outside to stay inside. But no one ever tells you how good the air quality is. It's good. Just trust me on this. Anyway, so, uh, so the, but how do you do communication? Sharing of the information, having information available, that's a very important, important part of what we do. Um, and that's what Rachel Carson did, daylighting issues, but also uh, what you could do with that information. And that's gonna be increasingly important on climate solutions going forward as well. And involvement of communities. That's something that we've, over the course of uh, the agency's 50 some years, we've learned the hard way of how to involve communities. In, and, and one of the things that I'll just as a side note uh, point out is that a lot of people complain about the pace of decision making at EPA. Well, you only complain about the pace if you're included in the conversation, right? Because you're outside the conversation, it's gone too fast. So that's the lesson that, you know, the other thing, and I'll get into this, is, and this is what economists care deeply about, that's my background, is that because all of our regulations are uh, based on a national standard, and it's one size fits all, because we believe everyone should have the same good air quality, same good drinking water quality. What that means is that because we don't take account in that framework um, of the conditions that already exist. Communities, for instance, that are already burdened with poor drinking water systems, or communities that are already poor and they can't afford to build these kinds of systems, for instance, uh, there's gonna be equity and distributional effects. So in terms of exposure also, right? The other things that I, I know, one, I, <laughs> there's somebody that I, I, I shouldn't call her out, that I, I talked about air quality monitoring. I mean, just because we're uh, uh, regulating a standard for a airshed, which is Phoenix wide, you're clearly gonna have some places where the air quality is better than the standard and poorer than the standard. Uh, just because of you're next to a highway or your, uh, your neighborhood only has trees and no car drives through it, right? So those are the kinds of things that we're starting, we've always cared about, but really difficult to address and in the environmental policy, that's always been a challenge and it's become bigger and bigger issue because people are very focused on equity and environmental justice issues. So these are something that hopefully the next generation of environmental policymakers will have a better solutions than the kinds of things that we've um, uh, figured out. The other is um, as things get more and more difficult, uh, and I, 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 I'll, I have a separate slide on that, is that the, the challenge of uh, environmental policymakers is um, 
the best way for me to do it is I'm an arbitrator of uh, arbiter of who pays. It's a really crass way of saying it, but that's what it is. So if I don't, if I, I make a decision of not doing something, somebody, a mom or a, a unborn or an infant will be exposed to certain pollutants and they pay. But if I make a certain other decision, the, the company or the industry that produces that particular pollutant will have to pay. Right. That's I just it's just like this again. These are my perspectives. Right. So so that is the reason that a lot of folks are trying to figure out how do you reduce the overall cost of pain? And that's the source of our interest in market based approaches. And I'll get more into that as well. And of course, we would like people to do this voluntarily. Right. Um, and. The other thing that uh, our innovations have brought, and all of us are responsible for this, one of the reasons that uh, people innovate is because you're required to innovate. Cars have become much more efficient. They don't pollute, right? Gasoline, if you, I don't know, I, I don't think it's in this area, but like in California and uh, in Washington state, there's a vapor recovery system in the gasoline pumps. You know, those are the innovations that people put in and those create jobs, right? new technologies and the formulation of gasoline. I know many, many of you probably don't like liquid fuels, but the idea of having a liquid fuel that's formulated better for the environment is something that's also, um, I would call that a green technology and a green job, people who are working on that, right? I don't want to exclude those people. And then of course, we have lots of things that I can talk about in terms of uh, innovative compliance strategies and enforcement strategies. We, knew, we now do things like remote sensing, so we don't have to send people out. We know people are polluting, uh, uh, and, and we know how to help them come to compliance because the idea is that we don't want to just penalize people as opposed to... Um, but at the bottom is the principle that most folks at EPA and, uh, and the law really uh, envisions is that the polluter should pay. All right, because the whole problem with the environment is an externality problem, right? Which is that people who should pay for the entirety of their imposition um, on, on the res natural resource and pollution imposition on the economy should pay. And so that's the primary goal of the policy innovations. And there's many things that I can talk about, but I don't have a lot of time. So, um, so opportunities, um, um, I think. A lot of you are already, you know about the, this administration's investments that are coming out on climate, water, and the brownfields area, infrastructure, and jobs. So, uh, Chris, I did do a quick search last night of the jobs that are, EPA has 56 positions open. By the way, EPA is a great place to work. I, 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 also, of course, if you don't mind working with me, that's okay, too. So... 56 open positions and uh, all the jobs range from student internships to people in my position. But uh, I'm get, what I always try to say is that the, the jobs range from also like IT and accounts and social sciences all the way to STEM uh, majors. And so I really encourage you to kind of go to USA Jobs and set up a profile so that you're ready to apply for any jobs that are coming. And I will make this offer personally. You can contact me if you find a job that you're interested in. Ask me and I'll be able to at least help you with what, what it is that you're... Oh, see, look, at it. that's the first time. Oh, my God. So the complexities and challenges. Um, um, the... <laughs> What I'm going to do is I, I want to get to, I, I went way over, so I want to kind of get to the questions and, you know, some conversations. So I'm going to skip through a lot of these things, but a lot of our pollutants are um, much more, uh, it, it, people talk about low hanging fruit. We've harvested all those. The things, all the successes, that talk, those are easy compared to what's ahead. Um, uh, and climate is one, but, you know, things like PFAS, you guys have heard about that contaminant. Um, um, and, you know, 6PPD in, in the tires and how it's killing salmon up in the Pacific Northwest. There's a lot of things that we are continuing to discover that we need to continue to uh, manage this. And so um, what I would say the complexity now is the knowledge. This is where the university setting and the academics come in. And the people who know 
the science and how to deal with these things, policymakers making good decisions, and resources to um, uh, get that done. So quickly, making decisions. I men mentioned that um, I have to make a call. No one ever says to me that, Ed, you don't have to do anything. EPA, at EPA, every day we make decisions. And people, every day people criticize us for making decisions. And rightly so, because we make decisions on their high degree of uncertainty. So quickly on the science. Definition of science. Okay, that's a process, right? You, everyone agrees with that, which means that the facts change. That's the foundation for us. But every year something new comes up and it actually sometimes contradicts the decisions that we based our, um, our decisions in the year before. Law, political influences, equity issues, all these things we have beyond science. We have to factor those things in because there is not a, um, and somebody asked me about political appointees earlier before we started and uh, who makes it and how they're made. A lot of our uh, political appointees, they come with, I would say, pure heart. Don't, don't all, everyone laugh or anything about this, but, but it is true in that people who come to EPA want to work on the environment how they want to do it. This is where the risk management comes in, right? They have their own views. All of you have your views about what to do, right? And I do too. The question is, how do we kind of make that transparent and make sure that uh, the uncertainties and information needs are important? So what I'm going to do is actually stop here because I don't want to, I have a, a, a few more slides, but I'm happy to talk to you about that at a later point. But the key thing, the only thing that I, I'll leave you with in the other slides is that the climate issue, uh, which I am really passionate about, is that it's a global problem. So the mitigation work is a solution for a global problem, greenhouse gas reduction. But all the impacts are local. That has profound implications for policy, right? So again, what about people in Arizona versus people in Michigan? impacts are going to be very different. Should there be resources and policies that addresses the unique issues of Arizonans versus Michiganders? This is, people talk about the North-South discussion in the um, uh, climate debate, but that is really a North-South here in the United States. And I would say that that argument will probably be the one that's going to be really dominating, particularly climate adaptation and resilience uh, activities. I'll stop there. Okay, so if there's questions, put your hand up, I'll bring the mic to you. Chris. Since you mentioned my name about four times, I feel like I need to ask you a question. So at the Rio meetings in uh, 1991, 92, um, all heads of state adopted the principle of the precautionary principle, and you talked about uncertainty. And the precautionary principle is something I think that resonates well with health. Right, so when you go to a doctor, you don't wait until all the tests are in if you're suffering a high fever, right? They'll do something right away to bring down the fever. Is a precautionary principle something that's embedded in the way that the EPA operates? And if so, how do you communicate that to folks who say, well, wait a minute, maybe next year the facts will be different? Yeah, so actually uh, people should Google that because precautionary principle was a huge uh, point of debate among policymakers between the Europeans and the Americans, I think in the 90 in the 90s and the 2000s. And I think it's kind of died down a little bit now. Um, but it's really about how do you make decisions, again, about uncertainty. Precaution, you know, at least the way that it's been articulated is, if you see uh, a risk and you can possibly envision a huge um, uh, harm, right? It's a, pay, it's a, a trade off, right? Then should you take action in the absence of little or uncertain information? Now think about that. That's a risk management. It's not founded in, this is a debate, right? So the science issue comes in because that's a risk management based on people's views. 
So I think that's that's the, I'm just trying to articulate a debate. You all know which side I'm on on this one. But but the bottom line is the idea is that should you take action, even if you don't have the information to back you up, if the potential harm is so bad, right, on the climate stuff. This is why they was being discussed about a decade or two ago. The, the issue that most uh, American policymakers versus the European policymakers had, the Europeans were all okay with this. And in fact, their chemical regulations based on that principle. But in the United States, it was an extremely difficult concept because of how EPA, this is why I was talking about the basis of scientific evidence, right? And I say that again as a caveat, uh, Western scientific thinking, you know, where we do randomized samples and, you know, that is a fundamental, that's a foundation for the U.S. So I would say that it's a yes and no. Uh, it depends on the risk manager who's in power at the time, right? This, who's the EPA administrator? This is where you all, this is where the um, uh, elections matter. Yes. Um, thanks, Ed. So speaking about elections, so under the Biden administration, uh, the, legislation, the legislature passed the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which is kind of a misnomer. It was the largest uh, investment in climate policy in U.S. history. Uh, it's a generational, about $360 billion uh, invested just directly related to climate policy. Yeah. What, what is the EPA's um, role in implementing the Inflation Reduction Act and what type of funding um, has the EPA been, um, uh, been provided and how is the EPA advancing that funding yeah. to develop solutions? Yeah, I, I, I would say just simply that this is a huge amount of money. Just to give you a context, EPA's typical budget is uh, uh, under $10 billion a year. So the number that uh, uh, Dave mentioned is just not only unprecedented, but just huge amounts of money for uh, EPA. Ha having said that, however, it's still a drop in the bucket for, from experts who think that we need to tackle uh, climate solutions, right? Um, from EPA's perspective, so the, so the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, all of the provisions uh, really get at um, uh, not just EPA's role, but the whole government approach, right? We have the tax credits that are being uh, administered by Treasury and, EP and the work that EPA is doing, and I think DOE as well, um, is to use the money to leverage more action by the private sector. I mean, that's not explicitly said, but if you look at some of the provisions, that's how it is structured. So EPA has grant programs. Uh, and a lot of the grant programs, I think ASU is part of the Tic Tac that I know, uh, is to help communities have access to that money, communities that have never received money. So there's uh, millions of dollars in that category. And the big chunk of money that EPA has is about $27 billion in the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. But the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is not a grant program. It's really to fund green banks. Um, and to uh, facilitate more investment by uh, private investors into climate solution. So, and by the way, uh, this is where I'm gonna do the Taylor Swift thing and promote myself. Um, uh, I, I, uh, thanks to Dave and others at, at GFL, I'm gonna be doing a climate chat called Climate Chat with You. And uh, we're doing three in the next month. And uh, um, uh, two, the first one is on the 29th, I believe, 29th. And uh, I'm having a, a speaker who's coming and working with the Basils Fund to figure out how to increase private investment using public money uh, into climate solutions. And then I have uh, speakers from EPA on April 8th. And then uh, I think on uh, the 17th of April, I also have speakers coming from the Southwest here, uh, Nevada, uh, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, obviously, uh, and Utah to come and talk about the green bank uh, activity here. So I'm trying to bring practitioners to talk about the real things that they're working on, not just the high level stuff that I'm talking about. So thanks for the opportunity to plug my show. Hi, Ed. Um, so Hello I'm, there. <laughs> hi. Um, I'm really curious to hear about, so from your own experience and from looking back in your career and what you imagine for the future of EPA and the people working in it, how can we at the School of Sustainability as graduate students and members of this academic unit, as professors, faculty, staff, 
be preparing students, undergraduate students especially, and, and graduate students for careers as decision makers at the federal level and thinking about all of these attributes that you have listed there, what what kind of things do you imagine as being central for sending our students to an EPA job market well prepared to be effective in their roles? Yeah, so the technical, the, sort of the, the paperwork aspect of it, I think to getting the job is um, pretty burdensome, but I think there's an easy path for that. I could share more with you on that. But the other is, I think you have to really leverage the passion that you already have, right? Because um, you have to be prepared to um, navigate the environmental world and it's not a one track, right? I mean, as sustainability, I mean, what I mean by that is almost everyone that I'll bring for the chat with True Series, one of the things that I'm gonna try to do is have them talk about themselves how they got there, their, their environmental journey, right? And none of us have that path that is as clear as people would like. In fact, one of, uh, uh, Carrie O'Neill, who, who created the Green Bank in Connecticut, she was a computer science person at MIT. That's what she studied. She'd never imagined that she would be doing sustainability work or climate work, right? But it led into her being on the Wall Street and then let her passion you know, but the skill set, the, like the making decisions that I'm making, the STEM field, even if you're in a field that is social science, I mean, I, I studied economics, but Josh and I talk about the fact that, or Jenny, I mentioned, she's gone, where's Jenny? Anyway, so I talk about, you know, what the things that I use uh, as an analyst starting at EPA, I'm, you know, it's a, my, I was extremely happy that I had econometrics and calculus as a basis for my education. But that's because of the work that I wanted to do. But it's a wide open area. So one of the reasons that I mentioned those 52 um, jobs is not because you want them, but take a look at them to see what qualifications and what things that they're looking for. And does it call to you? That's another thing is I don't actually steer people to EPA if the regulatory work doesn't call you because it's a unique thing. I mean, cause there's, a, it's a huge burden. So I hope that is not clear. You can chat more anyway. All right, we'll go back to Josh. With I mentioned him several times, so he has to say something now. You mentioned me and you threw candy at me, yeah, so yeah. I, I am obligated. Um, yes, thank you. For, I, I really appreciated the, particularly the part where you were talking about, you know, really counting the successes. And this is something I do in my own teachings where yeah. like there are a lot of generations of students at this point that really don't get just how important environmental policy has been and how much uh, victories, how many victories we have had. Um, I have a follow-up question. At first I gave up my mic, but then I, I think I want to push you a little bit more at, on, um, you know, we're in a school of sustainability here, and we're thinking about policy um, as part of what we do. Um, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit beyond just sort of how things are now, but as we're looking at these emerging concerns and, you know, the, the big challenges that you've spoken of, and both like within EPA, but then in less compliance-based, um, you know, government entities, um, what are you, do you see as new skills? What are the cutting edge? What are the kind of, air, you know, what, what do we need to be learning differently and doing differently, particularly in this space of environmental or sustainability policy? And what might that mean in terms of how we need to be training our students differently? So uh, other than basic skills that we could all chat about in classes and so on, the reason that I talk about one of the uh, President Crow's aspiration, principled innovation is what, so, <laughs> I was an optimistic little kid uh, when I started this, and I still am optimistic, but not so little or not so young. Uh, but I thought that EPA doesn't have to exist, right? When you start your career and you say, hey, why do we need to do this? The idea is that we shouldn't be polluting the environment. We're going to do our job and we go away. That was my dream, all right? So what's happened is what this principled innovation and what President Crow talks about, is that the two things that we're unable to do and you need people to think about is how do you um, live and have innovation and create new things without harming the environment? 
I mean, that sounds like such a simple concept, but it is, we have been unable to do that historically. So I would urge everyone to think about it, even the faculty, right? I was talking to an engineering faculty and they said, well, how do we do that when we're inventing something uh, right now? Right? And so this is why studying the history of DDT, even going to Silent Spring is really important because they should have known better. But we could say that about history, but how do you train people to think forward on that? The second piece, recognizing that all of our problems impact people differently. Not, it's not an equal treatment issue, but on the environment, people are, uh, because of existing conditions of where people live, geography, demographics, and income, around the world, not just in Phoenix, you know, there's a scale issue, right? Everyone is affected differently. The, the frontier work to me on the environment is how do we deal with that going forward? Because a lot of the big, um, um, uh, the environmental problems that are pervasive for everyone, right? We could address them at a global level, like the, what, I, what we talked about, even climate change, greenhouse gas reductions. That, that's, a, that's something that you can deal with anywhere in the world. But the impacts of that is something that you have to deal with locally. We don't have a mechanism in policy mechanism, a good one to deal with that in the United States, anywhere in the world. And I think that's, to me, those two are the frontier work that I, I really do believe needs to be done. Now, beyond a layer below that is what are the skills and what are the training that you need to uh, be able to have an impact on those two issues is what I would say. Don't tell President Corey, if you ever see him, that I interpreted his aspiration this way. Because I don't think he's there. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Ed, Ed, thank you very much for a really inspiring presentation. Um, my question is around what you've just been talking about and greenhouse gases, and it's about methane. And we know methane is 50 or 60 times more impactful in terms of the greenhouse gas effect than CO2. And then the recent launch of the methane sat, uh, which will be able to map emissions from particularly oil and, and gas plants. Is that something the EPA are involved in and can they use information like that to, to regulate? Okay, I can't say for sure because you know the agency is 16,000 employees. So the, I, I, I am sure we are. But one of the things that I would just comment on is the knowledge that is involved in doing that in anything is something that just to answer Josh, uh, is to me um, uh, a frontier work, right? I mean, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about is how do we do more of that? So knowledge and data, and how do you get that to people who could make decisions quickly? And that's another thing that I didn't talk about in this context, but a lot of the information that you're working on here and elsewhere do not get to decision makers. I don't know about a lot of these things unless, because you know, there's a slow process right, of uh, academic kind of uh, uh, scrutiny that you have to go through uh, and building of data sets and so on. But um, a lot of the information that the local communities need and policymakers need, need to be uh, developed very quickly. The other thing about the methane, since you talked about the potent greenhouse gas effect, is that some of the information we just don't know enough. So when we were controlling uh, for the ozone layer, CFCs, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, we didn't know that that had a huge impact on, um, um, uh, it was a green, greenhouse, potent impact on the greenhouse gas uh, warming. Uh, and we didn't know that, but now we do. Uh, and so I think that these kinds of things that, you know, I would urge people to continue to uh, make it available to the policymakers. Okay. okay, I think that's all for the questions, but if you have more questions, please feel free to chat with Ed after and, and grab some snacks outside. But I want to thank you, Ed, for being here. That was wonderful. Hopefully everyone learned a lot.